New York girls, can you dance the polka? The Long Haul Podcast, America's Irish Voice. Interviews with inspiring immigrants, renowned Irish personalities, and discussions on all things Irish America. Presented by Michael Dorgan and Johnny Kennedy. Amazing things happen when a lot of people come together for a common good. And this is the power of community. This is the power of the Irish people. This is the power of Team Ashling. It's the power of Sancha. And um, that's the one takeaway that we have from, from this. Well done, everyone. You're absolutely unbelievable. Um, full steam ahead. Right, yeah. That was my good friend and proud Mayo man Seamus Keane after running a full marathon last year for Team Ashling and Sly into 2020 to raise money for Irish people in America who were hard hit by the pandemic. Seamus was asked to do the run at short notice but that didn't faze him because for Seamus it was all about the community coming together, something which really drives him. I recently sat down with Seamus to discuss his positive mindset, his road to America and his journey into fitness. What I also admire about Seamus is that he completed a master's degree in finance and then had the courage to completely change careers and switch to the fitness industry which better suits his affable personality. Seamus now runs fitness classes in Long Island City in Queens under the Clan Health banner which he created early last year. Seamus had only just found his feet in the industry when the pandemic hit and he had to quickly learn how to deliver fitness classes online and get up to speed with social media. The Irish Times even covered him streaming fitness classes from the roof of his apartment building in Queens. I first met Seamus at another event for the Ashling Centre around two and a half years ago and Seamus has done a tremendous amount of work for the centre which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. The centre is hosting a number of 6k runs throughout the city in October to mark the occasion and raise money for renovation work to its new premises. Seamus is an ambassador for the run in Queens on October 24th and will be providing training sessions in the lead up to the run for those who sign up. It will be another massive event for the Irish American community and if you'd like to sign up to Seamus' six-week training sessions to get you in shape, you can reach out to Seamus via his Instagram account at Clan Health. That's C-L-A-N-N-H-E-A-L-T-H. There's a link to sign up in his bio. There's plenty of laughs in this episode and as always be sure to let us know what you think on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and don't forget to check out our revamped new website thelonghaulpodcast.com that has all the latest Irish American sports news and more. We will have news and interviews from Sunday's New York Senior Football Final Clash between Barnabas and Sligo up on the site next week and all of our previous podcasts are up there too. Well Seamus Kane. Thanks very much for coming on the Long Haul Podcast, my old friend. <laughs> first things first, why do you call yourself Kane and it's spelled K-E-K-E-A-N-E? K -E -E -A -N -E? <laughs> uh, would you go way out of that, Michael Dorgan? Would you go way out of that? Roy Keane has got it wrong. <laughs> first off, well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, the Kane, or, uh, Kane name originated in Connemara in County Galway. And uh, then re relocated to the mighty town of Lewisburg and Mayo. You're um, banished, sorry. No, no, we just we just just got a bit too big for the place. <laughs> Fair enough, but you're a proud Mayo man, anyway, Seamus. Oh, definitely a pr proud Mayo man, Mike. I so, was, and I was even a pr prouder Mayo man this past weekend. So I was. So are they going to do it? Are they going to do Sam this year? Of course, they're going to do it this year. We, we'll do it the, the year that that's least expected. Oh of us. God! How many finals is this now? Eleven. Since I've been born in 1989, this will be the 11th. Yeah, and that's not including replays either. Jesus. So I can reel them off. 89, 96, 97, 4, 6, 12, 13, 16, 17, and 20. <laughs> well, Seamus, um, for all those defeats, you still have that positive attitude. So um, the first things first, um, that's one thing that struck me. We, met, we first met here, I'd say, about two years ago. We got together in the... Um, the Ashling Centre actually brought us together out in Givens' is home. We were doing, uh, Team Ashling were doing a little get-together and I went out doing a report on it and we did some interviews that kind of were trial and error, but uh, that's when I first met you. But what strikes me with you, Seamus, and this is, I could talk to you for hours and hours in this podcast, but what, what stri strikes me about you is your positivity. Your positivity. You and a good friend, another good friend of mine, Rob Heffernan, the race walker, I see very in the same light. You're the two most positive people 
I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> Anytime I see you, you're buzzing, you're in a good mood, you're an affable character, always in a positive mi mind mindset, mind frame. I Explain it. <laughs> <laughs> or am I going to crush you in this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mike. That that uh, that means a lot. It's better than you call it calling me negative, anyway. That's for sure. <laughs> my my dad has a has a great saying actually, and he's he's a very positive man, and he, he's he's a, a good good vibe to be around. But when people say something to him like that, he'll turn to him and he'll say, "Well, if you pay me to be negative, I'll be negative." <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Tell me. Seamus, um, growing up in Mayo, was it, was it a farming background you came from? Well, I learned the hard way a couple of months ago there. We went up climbing a mountain one, one weekend. You brought us up there with your good friend Owen Kelly. And I came back and we have a pool table downstairs well, the, in the building. And I said, you know what? No, I'm, I'm, I'm all right at pool. Like, and I was, I was wondering, <laughs> Seamus, no, I don't know. Like, we'll see, see. Well, you wiped the floor with me. I don't think I've ever... My father's a good pool player, like, but I've never come across a pool player as good as you. And you're moving around the table, or like Ronnie O'Sullivan, which you were telling me you grew up, you actually owned a bar back in uh, Mayo back in the day. We did, yeah, yeah, owned a bar back in the day and um, closed it when I was, when I was young, um, very young, but um, kept the pool table, or kept the pool table in where the old bar was. And um, there's a saying, Mike, that pool or snooker, when you're decent at it, that it's the sign of a, of a lost youth. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's definitely the case in my instance. <laughs> I used to spend Manny's an hour up at it and uh, during leave and cert exams and right through, through college, any study time that was allocated, it was allocated to the pool table instead of, instead of to books anyway, and that's for sure. <laughs> and I also found out that day as well that you're a fantastic piano player and singer. <laughs> Do people not know this about you, Seamus? Because I certainly didn't know it till that day. Next, he wiped the floor at me in the, uh, on the pool table, then went over, I'd show off here on the, on, the, on the piano, singing Coldplay. I was fascinated by it. So you're a multi-skilled... Multi Individual shapes. You, 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 you've been very complimentary so far, Mike. I'm waiting for the dig now. Oh, yeah, it's coming. This is, this is very unlike you. <laughs> Where did you get the... the how did you learn how to play the piano? Did you do it in school or was it... I was, did you have one in the bar as well? <laughs> <laughs> Karaoke. I was, I was stuck for money, Mike, as a young fella. I, I needed cash for crisp, crisps and chocolate, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that that one was more betting to me. Jesus, I I was I did it when I was younger. I did not like it at all whatsoever when I was doing it. And um, then years later, I heard when I was getting taught, I was doing Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. I, I had no more interest in Tchaikovsky or Beethoven. <laughs> and then years later, heard a few pop pop songs on it, and uh, or pop songs on on radio. And I was thinking, there, geez, that that's piano music. So I started looking up YouTube and teaching myself a bit. But uh, love playing it now, and and that it's mad because when I was younger I hated it, and I really like it now. And so if it's a, if there's a night out and there's a piano, are you the go-to guy? Do you do you do it then, or do you just do? do you, is it a hidden secret? See, this is the great thing about it. When you've got like two or three songs, you can have a great first impression on people. <laughs> so I really off those two or three songs that you heard that evening, and and then I'm I'm blacked. That's all I have. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Fair play. So Seamus, <laughs> tell me about growing up in Mayo. Uh, where, where, are you fr where are you from in Mayo? Where did you go to school and uh, then on to college? Yeah, Mike, I grew up in Lewisburg in Mayo and it's a small village uh, just at the foot of Crow Patrick. As a, a, there's a great line about it. Um, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere, but to the people who live there, it's the centre of their universe or our universe, I should say. So a small little town, less than 100 people in the town itself. Um, two brothers, Porrick Austin and my sister, and then my dad, PJ, he's at home. And, um, then my mom, she died when we were, was very young. So my family would be very, very close with, with each other. Mm. Um, dad's a farmer, had a farmer, butcher shop, had the bar as well, but that, that was closed when, when I was young. So the farm and the butcher shop all the way through. Um, and then went to college in Galway, um, went to college in Galway to study I put study now in adverted commas <laughs> <laughs> went to college in Galway to party and hole in the wall um, <laughs> I went there for, for did mechanical engineering in Galway actually 
and then went working in where was I working working in London for a bit, All right. um, and then came back to uh, Dublin and did a did a masters in finance in Dublin. Worked in Dublin for a bit, and then came to New York. Then in two thousand and fourteen, the very end of two thousand and fourteen. So did you do your degree in man- mechanical engineering and then you went to finance? Yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah, did my degree in mechanical engineering and, and I mentioned my, my my father earlier on for being a positive man. <laughs> <laughs> and he needed to be when I was going through college <laughs> because there was exams failed and there was yeah. years deferred. And I remember he said to me at one stage, he offered me an out. I think it was after two years in college and I'd, I'd failed second year. That was the only year I failed. But uh, he offered me an out and he said, maybe, you know, something along the lines of maybe colleges in four years, do you want to do something different? Yeah. And I said, no, no, no. And I put, put my head down and I somehow got a, got a degree out of it. But uh, I think he could see that, um, whereas my older siblings would have been more studious and, and mm. interested, basically, that um, I wasn't really the the office worker, cubicle kind of guy. <laughs> was it more party in college or... Did you, was it like, because from my own perspective, I had a couple of years in college and I wasn't really entirely sure that I wanted to do it. And I think if you're not driven to do it, you're like, you're, you're setting yourself up almost for failure. Like, so, and like, like yourself in th- that you changed the finance, I kind of, I did like a degree in history and then I changed, I actually did a master's in history. I went back and I did journalism. Like, mm. but what I'm saying is in the earlier on years I was doing arts and I wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do. I think yeah. first year I failed like by a percent went back two or three years later and then I repeated and I went through college again. But if you're not, did you, we, what, what brought you into mechanical engineering kind of is my question. And then finance, were you, you good at maths and you just, or were you kind of going for finance? Was it just like, oh, there's money in this job? What was kind of driving you initially? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, it's very close to what you said. So I was good at maths. That was one thing I was good at in school and I liked maths. And um, my brother, older brother did mechanical engineering. And one thing back in Ireland, it's probably changed a lot since now, but one thing when we're going through secondary school is we're very rarely asked what do we want to do or what's our our interests or our Mm. goal you know and so my the first time that i was asked that was in a a career guidance session by and i think it was with a it was with a technical graphics teacher that was just kind of inserted into that position for the school yeah and um I said, I don't know what I want to do. And he said, what subjects are you good at? I said, I'm good at maths. And he said, oh, your brother was an engineer, wasn't he? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, how's about becoming an engineer? I said, perfect. Um, so I put that down on the on the, on the the form, on the college CEO. application form. And um, then th- that was pretty much it. You know, I, I didn't really start thinking about what I wanted to do. I was only 16 doing the leave insert as well. How were you? Yeah, I was young enough now. Oh. So... I, I, uh, no fourth year, that was my downfall. The, no, exactly, yeah. yeah. No transition year, yeah. That's yeah, the excuse, so and then you never go on. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, so then, uh, yeah, I went to college to do engineering, and I had no more interest in engineering mm. now than, than the cat. I had interest in numbers, all right. But um, even the next couple of years, I kind of did it because that's what society said to do. It said to get a qualification and, yeah. and get a job, and dotty, dotty, dotty. Um, and it wasn't until a good few years after that um, I was actually my my sister. I went for lunch with my sister in Westport, and she could see that this. She could see that I d- I didn't want to do. Um, I I went into finance by the, at this stage, and um, she asked me a very simple question. She said, "If money was no object, yeah. um, she said, what would you do every day?" And it sounds ma- mad now, looking back on it, because I had qualifications in engineering and finance. And um, I said I'd like to be a fitness trainer, um, which was a million miles away from where I am now. But um, yeah, the point I'm getting to is I didn't, at what age was I then? I was 25 maybe. And I didn't honestly think about what I wanted to do until I was about 25 years old. And so when you were in school, were you always sporty, athletic? Playing soccer or football, what was the, the we always health conscious or was it just a complete U turn or was there always something lingering in uh, underneath that you? Good, you good question. Actually, I was health conscious for sure. Um, they're wasn't... all good questions, Seamus. Don't worry. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> they're all good questions. <laughs> Would you, Mike? Of course. I was, uh, I definitely didn't stand out at sports or, or that like I was very average at like athletic wise or anything like that. Um but I was health conscious definitely 
And then one thing when I was going through college, there was a, we were in a boxing club and there was one of the members of the boxing club in the college, uh, Pat Dively, and he went on to be a fitness trainer after he did, after he was in Galway. And um, he did this challenge where he got like five or 600 people and um, he brought them to, I think it was a Tough Mudder race or an adventure race. And they raised over a hundred grand for this charity. And I followed his story of going from college when I used to train with him in the boxing club. And he actually did an arts degree. Um, and then he went to become a fitness mm. trainer. And I followed his story about he'd got this amount of people to do this challenge and he'd raised this amount of money for the charity and created such a positive impact. And I was thinking, that is cool as shit. Like, mm. I'd love to do something like that. Um, and I think the seed was planted a a around that time, like a secret seed was planted. And so where, where did you where did you study fitness then? I went to, after I came back from New York from the first year, so it's 2015, okay. I was... So did you come over on a grad visa after getting the... Came okay. over from a grad visa, or with a grad visa, exactly. And I stayed for one year, exactly. And I was going home for six weeks in January to get my visa renewed. And then when I was at home, um, my dad went in for a checkup into Castlebar Hospital. Okay. And um, when he went in for his checkup, he said, you you collect me now from, from the hospital visit or whatever. So I went in, I collected him and I asked him what it was about. And he said it was nothing. And then later that evening, he's as many um, of, of that era, they kind of keep their heart, cards close to their chest. Yeah. So later that evening was out on the farm with him. And um, I said, what was that? What was that appointment about earlier on, you know? And he didn't answer me and I looked over and he couldn't speak. There was like a tear coming from his eye. So it, it turned out that he had got test results back from before Christmas and he'd been diagnosed with cancer. And um, that six weeks turnaround of my visa turned into about eight months. And it was around that time as well that I'd, that my sister went, went for lunch with my sister and she asked me that question. And she said, now you have time to do what you want. So during those eight months, I qualified, I studied online and qualified as okay. a personal trainer. Uh, dad, thankfully, got, got, went back, got back to full health. And then I started working with Andy Moran's gym in Castle Bar. To put water. Yeah, yeah, started that year as well. Um, and I always had New York to go back to New York and my site, sites. Yeah. So eventually then after about eight months, Dad got the all clear. And I'd done a few months work with, with Andy in Castle Bar, who was who was brilliant, who was really, really good. And um, I came to New York then, about mid-2016, I think it was. And so how did you get, who did you get a job with here then initially? Or Initially here, I came over, I hadn't a clue who to look for a job mm. or uh, what, any way of going about it. So I went to probably the biggest gym in the city or probably one of the biggest in the, in the country, Equinox. Oh yeah. Um, and I asked them for an internship. Um, and then they had they accepted me i applied for it and i got accepted and i was about six weeks in with them and uh, this tentative subject of a visa i had a visa like but i had to get a company to sign it off oh, yeah, of course yeah. um so then i went into whoever the manager was and i said oh by the way um we need to sign this off <laughs> and they said by the way uh, you don't have a job next week they, they just got very scared of yeah, the whole yeah. visa thing um so then i was in a bit of a loop and uh, Owen O'Kelly, who's an Irish Irish guy from Clare, he was opening a gym in Upper Manhattan and got introduced to Owen through a mutual friend, Rob Gaynor. And um, Owen was, was uh, starting uh, adult and kids and youth classes. So then I got sorted with him with uh, my visa and then started working with Owen and then he set me up with another internship downtown, which is, which was actually amazing. It was a really good, I learned a huge amount. Mm. It was much less uh, glamorous than the Equinox one. I was scrubbing toilets for a lot of it and yeah. uh, doing laundry and that, but I learned a huge amount. I was working with some of the best trainers in the city. They were like Olympic level coaches and um, just really, really good. And I was, I was like a sponge for knowledge with them. So I was very lucky to get that. So did you, knew, did you know straight away that this is, even when you're scrubbing toilets, that you knew that like, this is the industry I want to be in and kind of no regrets? Do you have it, you, you've never, in other words, have you look, never looked back kind of a... Yeah, kind of a oh, oh, 100%. It was, it was I, I saw this as my chance. 
So I knew well, like people kind of go on about visas over here that it's it's a pain to get them and then you get something for them. And it is definitely, but I had a 12 month visa that time and I knew that I had 12 months to like make it to an, to an extent to like, to, to impress these people to get, to yeah. get another visa on top of that. And uh, I was very hungry. I was hungry to succeed and, and I loved what I was doing. It was the first time that I'd ever done something that I really loved. Um, and Jeez. the saying that you have, like, you don't work if you find something yeah. you love or you don't work at it, whatever that is. It was very close to that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I was got, got lucky now. You never work a day in your life if you enjoy what you're doing or something like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And tell me, what, what, what is it that draws, what's, what does fitness do for you? What's the, what's the draw on it for you? It's, um, to put it simply, it's working with people who, who do some, so, some fitness trainers love working with the, the, the top athletes. Um, that's their why, if you like. Mine is much more basic. I love working with people who almost don't exercise or who don't like it. Um, people who fall into poor habits, into poor routines and seeing the power of just a small bit of exercise daily, eating a little better and taking them on a journey from not liking it or liking it very little to really liking it and how much that affects other areas of their life, their family, their relationships, their work, their energy levels, the whole lot. Because you have a big, you have like diverse is the kind of the wrong term, but you have a big demo, demographic of different people in your, in your classes, don't you? Down in Hunter's Point, you'd have young, old, different, mm. is that, that you, you really lo enjoy that? For sure. Mm. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, it's kind of cool. You'd, before, before the classes or we do, we do hikes away as well mm. sometimes. And one of the kind of questions I suppose on, on the hikes to be a d age demographic of maybe 20 to 60 mm. was wondering how will these people mingle? And it's really cool. Like most of the, the crew that go on it are American or Irish American or some, uh, some interaction with that. But you'd find the older people advising the younger people and telling them stories of when they first came over. Um, and, yeah. and then the younger people are doing the same, being genuinely interested. And what we do as well with classes or with the hike, we it's, it's by all means, it's about the, about the exercise, but we'd always do something communal after whether it's going for like a coffee or a bite to eat or mm. a drink or something like that. And it's, it's great to see the mix between the, that, that's with clan health isn't it i'll come back to that in just a moment but i just want to ask you from from your story about doing something that you really didn't enjoy to really finding your your calling in life what were the less what, what kind of lessons do you have for people and were there any kind of people that you looked up to that, that helped you you know your 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 family helped you is there any kind of other person that did like, i think you spoke of gary v before i heard someone that you look up to that did to guide you so what lessons do you have for people that may, might say in their thirties and they're in a job that they don't really, mm. they don't really enjoy. Like, is it get out or it's sometimes it's not as easy as that. Yeah. And for me, it definitely wasn't. I remember the, the one thing that held me back from taking action was fear. And it might sound a, a bit silly now, but what I mean, what I mean by fear is number one, kind of who am I to think that I can be a fitness trainer? I'm, at my uh, qualifications are in engineering and finance. Um, and then number two, am I doing the right thing by society? Like I've a set, I've a good job here. I was working mm. down on wall street for the first part of, of, uh, of when I was here in Ireland for a bit, or sorry, when I was in New York. And, um, the one thing that was holding me back was fear, fear of what, if it was the right move and fear of what others thought as well. Um, whereas fast forward four or five years, that's turned into a massive strength. Like there's a lot of fitness trainers out there who cannot interact with office workers who, or who cannot understand their position. Whereas yeah. I know they might only have 20 or 30 minutes to exercise per day. Um, or I know that they have other stresses in life, like targets to meet or family yeah. commitments or whatever. I, I heard you on uh, Shane Finn's podcast when you said that thing about Gary V and Gary V is someone that I, I listened to the crushing it or read the, the audio book. And I remember the time when I was trying to switch over to the journalism thing that Gary V was like if you don't enjoy what you're doing there's always an out so like if you're doing your 9 to 5 9 to 6 he's like what are you doing between 6 and 12 or 6 and 2 in the morning every night yeah. are you watching a Netflix series are you, you, know, are you watching the match on TV you got to 
priorities. There's your time to do your stuff on the side. Yeah. And I remember I was doing my stuff on the side. I was working a different job, different, mm. totally different in the industry. And I was doing my bits on the side then every night. And I was like, you know, it was, it was, I, I would tell anyone who's in that situation, listen to the Gary V audio book or read it, the crushing it. And it's just like, bang, do you know, you can do this. Just, you're not supposed to be in a job that you don't really enjoy doing. And for the, for me as well, I came out here and I kind of find this is what I wanted to do. So our paths kind of, crossed at the same time as well when you came out here and it was the Ashling Centre that we crossed paths with. Tell me how how important the Ashling Centre was for you when you first came out and what do you do with the, the Ashling Irish Centre, which are an immigration um, centre up there in Yonkers slash McLean Avenue. That's right. Yeah, we did our pass counts. And I'll just add on that other bit as well with the with the whole Gary V thing. I completely agree with you. It's so much on mindset. And there's a very good line that I heard at the time is, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find an excuse. And that's the same with, with anything, whether it's yeah. changing a career, whether it's getting in better shape, whether it's going for a job promotion. If you want, if you want it, you'll find a way. If you yeah. don't, you'll find an excuse. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Um, so we had a technical difficulty there. So uh, <laughs> anyway, Shane. Don't like us, Mike. <laughs> don't like us. <laughs> Just how we met, don't even give it to some. <laughs> I had Seamus, I had Seamus standing there with an interview to tripod and he was talking away, talking away and uh, I listened back to it afterwards. Uh, no sound went through. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least you're all good with it anyway, Seamus. So, uh, we're, we, we'll drive on. So, you were telling me about the um, the Ashling Centre and how you got first, we'll just go back over in case you didn't um, catch her on the video there. So, you first got involved with the Ashling Centre. Yeah. How? It was, um, it was when I was home one time a couple, two years ago, pretty much exactly, I spotted that this actually Ashling Centre in Yonkers had got about uh, two or three hundred people to a race, um, mm. a marathon event, and it was all fundraising for this, for this uh, group. Uh, they were a non-profit, and I sent them a message when I was at home, and I got put in touch with Catherine Flood, yeah. a mighty woman, Catherine Flood. And um, great woman, in case I didn't say that the last time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I got in touch with her, she said, "Come along and see the center when you get back to uh, when you get back to New York." So I did the following week. Yeah. Went up with her. She told me about all the great programs they do with the youth, the elderly, the homeless. Just some really community-driven, altruistic stuff. Now. It's great. And then you started, so she asked you to do, uh, to take, they were kind of spreading their wings, weren't they? Like, because um, they're way up in Yonkers there for people who don't know. It's kind of, as you were saying earlier, north of Manhattan. So Queens is about, it's a good hour down on the subway, down to the to the east of the, the five boroughs. And they had you getting like people, because people around the city are part of the Ashling Centre. Like they're, yeah. they, they, are, they, may, they might have started living up by Woodlawn and then they moved out to Queens. And, and I know there's people in Maspit that are very heavily involved at the Ashling Centre. So they asked you to kind of take a Queens crew, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So they wanted to get, they had, they had a few people in Queens who were, who wanted to get involved with this running group. Mm. And um, she asked me then to kick it off. And it was two years ago, exactly, because there was a picture put up on Facebook of a two year reminder. Um, and then we met in uh, met in a park in, in Juniper Juniper Park, Juniper park. in Maspeth, and we got started with maybe ten or twelve people the first evening, and there was a four hundred meter track, and in the four hundred meter track it was nobody could run it really, very, maybe one or two could, but it was like walk the corners and run the straights. Um, that was two years ago and since then that, that running group has went on to do 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, the full marathons. And tell me, you're doing a big fundraiser now for the Ashing Centre. They're coming up on their 25-year anniversary. They're expanding the centre. They're uh, refurbishing. They, they bought the, the building next door and they've flattened two buildings now and they're making one big centre and mm. there's a kind of an anniversary and a fundraiser going on over the next two months here. So tell me what's what's involved and what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's um, the Ashling Centre uh, six weeks to 6K challenge and it's for their 25th year celebration. So it's be going, going to be going from September 13th, the actual six weeks until the very end of October. Um, registration for it will be August 30th until September 13th. So it's from a very much so a beginner to an advanced program. Anyone can walk it, they can jog it, they can run it, they can crawl it, whatever way they want to do it. But um, yeah, the goal of it all is to get as, as many people involved as possible with the Irish, Irish-Americans, with anyone. 
um, in the event and creating awareness and, and fundraising for, for the group as well. So tell me, how do people get involved? So people get involved with, we go to the Ashling Centre Facebook page is the easiest way to do it. There's an Eventbrite link on the Ashling Centre Facebook page. Uh, you can also contact our own page. Um, the Clan Health Instagram is the most most active. And um, over the six weeks from September 13th until October 23rd, we'll be giving everyone a full training plan. Um, as part of registration, they'll also get a limited edition t-shirt and they'll get weekly training tips and they'll get the event day ticket at the end of October as well. Okay. There's four dates at the end of October. 23rd will be Manhattan in Central Park at 9 a.m. 24th will be in Queens, Juniper Park at 9 a.m. 30th and 31st will be in Rockland and in Yonkers. Okay, huge, huge kind of a fundraiser so for the for the Ashing Centre. Exactly, yeah, it's going to be massive. It's going to be a, be a ton of fun now. Looking forward to good. that. And I'm looking forward to see the centre too. Yeah, big It'll time. be something else. Tell me, let's just go back. Uh, I've written down here Visa. <laughs> <laughs> because I know, because I know we've had visa troubles, as you know, and I know you've had visa troubles. Tell me how many times you went for that H one B one visa. <laughs> if you want to talk the H one B, yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, the H one B, I definitely, definitely went for two, if not three times. The H one B is a lottery, um, as far as I'm aware, and. Um, you either get picked or you don't. I think it's like a one in three chance. Yeah, I think it's like a... It's, so Laura has that. It's a working visa. So I think the quota is like 70, 80,000 a year and maybe 180,000 might apply. And that's why you might get one or two or one or three in chance mm. of getting it. Yeah. So you got knocked down at least twice. At you least twice, if not three times. Yeah, exactly. So I kept ahead of the game um, with a very good lawyer. Uh, Lorcan Shannon is excellent. Um, so he helped a lot. And was also able to get uh, the J visa. Friend, friend of the pod. Larkin, Larkin. <laughs> friend of the pod. <laughs> Another great man. And friend of Laura too. For God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Saviour, but he was very good, yeah. He's so excellent. he helped you then with the, was it the O you went for? Yeah, the O uh, I went for in the end. Yeah, that was that's the visa that I'm currently on now. Yeah, and it's a three-year visa is the O visa. It's a, it's a okay. rolling visa. So it's, yeah. Okay, people with extraordinary ability, as well, I, that, keep, I keep telling Johnny when he's on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me. T t titles can be misleading. <laughs> yeah, I go with that. <laughs> Tell me, Seamus, of course, um, about 18 months ago, as we all know, COVID hit, mm. and you were just kind of uh, finding your feet, well, you were just kind of establishing yourself in the fitness industry, well, I said you were established, and then the whole landscape changed for fitness how how did it change for you and how did you adapt um it com completely changed to to be honest it was t uh, the start of 2020 and i was just as you said finding my feet as being a trainer over here i had a couple of internships done with gyms and internships you generally don't get paid or you get paid very little mm. so um was just starting to do well as a trainer building up a good um client base did a lot of my work out of hanneman health club in manhattan and um, literally, as the same with everyone in the space of like 24 or 48 hours, the whole lot was pulled pulled from under our feet. And um, I remember, I think it was March 16th, we were in the gym in Manhattan and Owen, who owns it, said he, had to, he was closing the doors for God knows how long. I think in our heads that time, it was like maybe two weeks or something like that. Yeah. And it ended up being five months. But um, a lot of people were going home to Ireland a lot of people in, in my position and in your own as well, I'm sure. And it, the thought did cross my mind, but I thought that if I went back home, um, I'd get comfortable. And I thought that if I stayed in New York, I'd have to get something going. As to what that was, I didn't know. I hadn't a clue. Please, yeah. um, but I knew I'd like an online, I'd been toying with the idea of setting up online programs for like, six or 12 months and i thought right my back is against the wall now i have to come up with something and just generally i know my the way my mind works if if, if i'm comfortable I, I i don't take action but when i'm uncomfortable i have to take action and um yeah then we started that was that was march 
um, took a couple of weeks chilling, watching watching the whole Netflix, and and did that for a while. Well, what was that? Tiger King was on. Oh, at the yeah. time, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what was the song again? Her? We did just getting it. Yeah, Tiger. That was a good. That was a good series. So then, uh, then I was burning through through money here fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so started started one day actually. The first I remember the first day I did it. It was a Facebook. I did a Facebook live class and going back to like quitting the job and being a fitness trainer fear going on a camera was my massive fear back then a uh, huge and i remember thinking will i do it won't i do it and i decided to do it and i i still remember so i saw i had nowhere to do it that was the other thing i couldn't do it in my apartment it was too small so the only place was on my roof and in, in the apartment building and this is, it's not like a, a glamorous roof. It's a shitty roof, you know? It's in Woodside. So Woodside, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I went up on top of the roof and uh, <laughs> I recorded a fitness class. And I I think one person joined in, my aunt in, in Westmead. <laughs> and she threw up like a couple of comments like, well done or, or, or good on you and sent me a message after and said that was great. And... <laughs> I thought after the classes, so look at it's done now. I've dipped my toe, yeah. And um, she got something out of it, so I thought if if it's just her that's getting something out of it, um, well, I'll do it now for the next few weeks. And that was at the start of April, about the start of April. Um, and to make a long story short, short, Michael, I started doing sessions. Then started doing classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning from the roof. And I got my housemate, Brian McHugh and the pair of us, we painted the roof black and we had no name for this or anything. I had no name for it. Um, and then I was thinking one day, what would, what, what, what I call it and, uh, what I wanted to create. And what I always wanted to do as a fitness trainer is create a community. And it was going back to maybe that thing that I mentioned earlier on about the getting mm. a group of people to do something for charity. So I looked up the Irish word for like community or family and, and in, uh, on Google Translate because I didn't pay attention in school. <laughs> <laughs> Pass Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Just about got that too. And uh, Clan Health came off. So I, I went with that name and got a logo as well. It's an old Irish Celtic symbol that means mm. unity. And um, started recording the classes. So cl clan is unity and community slash community is it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Clan is community, and then the symbol then is a is a trinity knot, and this uh, that's our logo. And the trinity knot then is uh, mm. symbolising the father, the mother, the children in old Celtic Ireland. Okay. Yeah, so it's a kind of, it's cool enough. And um, then anyway, for April and May, started doing these classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you remember around that time, around the start of COVID, no one was leaving their houses. No one was really interacting, bar through like Zoom quizzes and maybe calling yeah. each other every once in a while. And completely like almost unintentionally, um, there wasn't any skill to it because uh, it wasn't planned, but started building a community online with this. And I had like 20, 30 people regularly tuning in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and some then even two or three times that number up on like 70, 80 when I did the one with Laura that time. Mm. And it was amazing to see the people like tuning in, saying hello. And I had cousins and people that, some people I'd never met. I had cousins that I hadn't met in 10 or 12 years and they were tuning in and we'd send a message to each other over and back. And it was a great thing, certainly for me around the time and being in New York and being away from my family. And then they'd, they'd messaged me as well and said it's something that they really like kick and start kick starting their day and and uh, something they look forward to so that's how that's how that started and then we use that traction then into summer to get something going and we is, who's we is, uh, it, is it is it yeah go on uh, so oh, sorry so uh, it's since gone into we at the, at the start it was just my myself and um shane finn was heavily involved that certainly that first first year and um now we have we have a bunch of trainers that that do stuff with it as well. Um, Shelley, John Collins, Michaela, All and right. um, yeah. just the one thing about us is it's just the community feel. Like it, yeah. um, there's the trainers, but then there's the people who train with us, and it's it's uh, mighty. I remember when COVID happened, and like you're a very friendly guy, as we said, like you know, a very people person. But it strikes me that you're like you would have kind of a shyness in front of the camera. 
and that struck me when we were only giving this home as well. But I actually was, I'm very shy in front of the camera. That's why I was always, that's why I was always writing. And it was only when this chance, this came about with Johnny to do the, the podcast. I said, like, I just go with it. Like, but I used to hate hearing my voice or when yeah. I was interviewing that day, I was just nervous or whatever. But like, it just shows, goes to show, come out of your comfort zone. But when COVID hit, you weren't really like a lot of fitness trainers are on social media. Like it's Laura's does a lot on social media, but you didn't really have a lot on social media and you had to, you had to kind of really train to do train yourself with new skills. I remember you telling me, um, and you were looking for a tripod to do the, the, the stuff, the, right. any tripod, or could you show me how to get a tripod? What ear pods will I get? So it was like completely different for you. Like, but looking back on it now, like it was just, how, how do you look back on it? It's gas, and when when you say there, when I say I recorded myself the first day, the the recording equipment that I had, I got a bin, a tall bin, and I got an old runner, and <laughs> and I got my my shitty iPhone, and I and I put it on top of those. I still have pictures of it actually, and I mean that was my starting yeah. point, you know. So that was as basic as you yeah. can get. And when you when you talk about a social media following, I, I, I'd absolutely nothing really, no presence. I mean, yeah. no presence at all. Um, so yeah, I was completely getting out of my comfort zone. But isn't that great? I remember when we started off doing this podcast with Johnny, we were uh, I was trying to get all these cameras, three cameras, and everything. And he was like, you know, we'll just start with the basics. And looking back, and we some old footage, and you're just like, geez, everyone has to start kind of somewhere. Like, and we and we built from there too. But um, when you so you, so you built from the clan held the top of your on your roof. So if people don't know, you became internationally famous for that in a way the irish times covered it that's right yeah 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 it was gas man, man on roof <laughs> <laughs> acting the gob shit <laughs> you know i'm only messing but the irish times did a big write-up on you how that was that was great wasn't it that was cool that was very cool the irish times did but the best one was the tommy Marin show on midwest radio oh really i didn't know what's that about they, what? they, they interviewed you was it uh, they interviewed you yeah, right. yeah so that was the most self-satisfactory you know? <laughs> and, that'd be the neil prendable show for us like in Park, yeah. There you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that went down a lot better with people at home now than the Irish Times. The Irish Times, how do? <laughs> so, so Clan Health has kind of exploded from there, like, hasn't it? It's really like that's is that your main is Clan Health everything now for you? It's all is it all classes you do now through through Clan Health? And pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Still, I'm sorry, with Owen as still well. Still do a bit with Owen, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, Clan Health is a fu full time gig now, um, which is great. It's just going. It's it's a uh, it's growing all the time and uh, it's 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 deadly. It's, it couldn't be going any better, Michael, to be honest with you. So t tell me, when are the classes on? Where are the classes for people who are listening here in Queens and how do you get there? And there's a relationship with Shane Finn as well, isn't there, who's based in Kerry? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Another um, mad fucker. What'd you say? <laughs> Another mad fucker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, 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 You're swimming across the Atlantic there every <laughs> second day. Jesus Christ. And then you going up mountains. I'll, I'll get into that now in a second. Jesus. <laughs> Go on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh Shane is a gas man. <laughs> He's a, 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 we had we have classes going now uh, what is it, six days a week down yeah. by the water in Long Island City. Yeah. So Hunters Point South Park, we don't train on Sundays. Sunday is the day for mass for chapel. <laughs> <laughs> so we train six days a week down there. And um we have we also have our we have an online program going as well. Right. Um and we do some personal one to one training. So it's a mix now between physical and then um, we 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 train people online as well. Um, and is the is the going away thing part of the clan health? You do kind of hikes and stuff, or tell me more about that. That's right, yeah. And that was stuff originally started started with Owen um, at Hanneman, and we go on hikes upstate to New York, um, and then as well, all going well now, and things start returning to normal. Um, there was groups brought back to Ireland um, by both, or to Clare, where, where Owen's, Owen's family are from, and also to Dingle, to Shane. So we'll, okay. we'll go ahead with, with starting that back again, bringing them back on like adventure trips or running trips or wellness trips, that, that kind okay. of stuff. So for Seamus, for relaxing or downtime, what are your favorite hobbies? And I know what they are. <laughs> Climbing mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, because Des is another, of course, Des is your... Uh, 
your roommate but uh, that's what you like to do on your even your time off but that's what you love doing what about we climbed the mountain there over over the winter but that's your it's your big kind of pa- uh, pastime isn't it yeah it is now in fairness that's I, I do I love the outdoors um, and I'm very fortunate to get out there quite a bit um, but yeah downtime uh, chilling chilling by a swimming pool is nice as well Mike you know don't get me wrong <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, definitely do love getting getting upstate New York, Catskills, mm. anywhere like that. Because one thing about New York, as I'm sure you will testify as well, is that mm. it's a lot, you know. Lot. Um, yeah. It's constant go, like. Yeah. And you can get caught, especially when you're when when you don't come from that. You come from Cork, I come from Mayo, and we're not used to that, you know. And under normal circumstances, we we get back a couple of times home per year, so you at least get away from it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just a complete separation from the city and either going up to, to New Palace and going for a bite to eat or just going up and going for a hike yeah. is is my... Do you enjoy those extreme temperatures when we were up there in the snow and, <laughs> <laughs> and I was freezing and Laura was freezing and we were like, this is great, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shame is delighted. So <laughs> you get a kick out of it. I get a kick out of out of seeing people come um, to minus 15 degrees temperature without any gloves. That's how you get a kick out of that, all right? <laughs> Who do something like that, James? <laughs> I don't know, Mike. <laughs> to make it better, I've done it myself. <laughs> so in terms of fitness, Seamus, you've done a couple of marathons. You've done the New York Marathon. Done the New York Marathon t- uh, two years ago. Yeah, mm. 2019. And uh, struggled through it now. I definitely struggled through it. Um, I wouldn't, my background... I wouldn't be a, a distance runner, certainly. Shorter runs, Spartan races, like three miles or five miles. Love doing them. Mm. Love the challenge of like climbing ropes, that kind of stuff. So long, monotonous runs. I just hadn't done it before, you know. So I did it for charity two years ago. There was 12 of us all together. And it was great. An incredible experience. Um, another thing that's definitely outside the comfort zone. And like, like most things in life, the, the best things are outside yeah. of our comfort zone. People say that doing the New York Marathon is very special. Did you? How would you have it up there as one of your top achievements or experiences? Absolutely, it was incredible. Um, Shane Finn had actually he got me into the running bug. It was around like I say, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back for doing a marathon. Um, it was the same year that he ran and cycled across America. But actually, he is a very good. In fairness yeah. to him, he's a very good line. He says that him r- running or cycling across America or me doing a marathon, it's just as significant as housewife with two or three kids doing a 5k you know yeah anything that anything that gets people uncomfortable is 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 just as significant so yeah it was incredible the atmosphere was unbelievable mike and the whole the feel good factor um and you you arrive to the start line unsure if you're able to do it for me i hadn't trained a hell of a lot so the most i'd done before it was 18 miles and struggled through that Mm. but then you arrive in the start line and you see people two or three times your age you see people with one leg uh, hopping along mm. on crutches um, and it's just I remember the high after doing it I think it was on a Sunday and the high a big high lasted till at least the Wednesday Thursday it Cheers. was class yeah. and it was really really cool what were you like after what was the body like after it can you I've seen people after day, a day after the marathon they can't walk <laughs> was, was, was fairly stiff now it was definitely fairly stiff yeah we went down we went to uh, there was there's a Russian and Turkish bath in East Village. It's closed now, but it's uh, anyone who's been to it will just know what I mean. It's hard to describe. Extreme hot temperatures, and we went down there the next day. Um, got like ice yeah. therapy and and hot therapy, but there was one of our group, uh, Kelly and Moina, and he was after. He celebrated after the marathon. He was after a feed of drink. <laughs> and he wasn't wasn't feeling too well in the extreme temperatures the next day. <laughs> Is it good for you, from a fitness point of view, doing mar- doing, doing the Giants? I've been trying to, to, to follow Laura there. She's doing the marathon uh, this year, as you know. But I've been to like 14k the other night. And I just feel that I'm cramping up because mm. like, you're going slowly. So last night I did a few sprints as if I was playing Ga. And like, I... I feel a lot more comfortable doing the sprints rather than the. I just feel like I'm tightening up because mm. is it is it is it good good for you or what's the yes yeah. the... and and one thing uh, one thing that I will say about exercise um on a general scale is that I don't believe that 
necessarily w- one type is better than another. Whatever mm. gets a person off the couch. Yeah. And um, whether it's yoga, Pilates, whether it's sprinting, whether it's a gym session or whether it's long distance running. One thing I do love about something like a marathon is that it really forces you to get uncomfortable. Like, and, and I yeah. say that now, no one can really understand that in that sense, unless they've gone out and done like an eight mile or a 10 mile run. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing about long distance running is that it's a great analogy for achieving anything, whether it's like a job promotion or building a business. It's about consistently getting better yeah. towards an end goal. And I love that about it. Um, and then as well, going back to back to one other part about about long distance running that I love or about marathon running is the community feel of it. And that marathon day, when you do something that you don't think that you're physically capable of doing, it's an incredible buzz. Like, mm, and yeah. everyone else around you doing it as yeah. well. Like, it's it's class. Yeah. I'm not going to do one. <laughs> I wouldn't count you out from what I've heard. Nah, I have too many <laughs> injuries. And the surgeon told me about 10 years ago, whatever you do when you kind of retire, although I'll never retire. But he <laughs> said, don't, just please don't do road running. And uh, I don't know, I had a bit of cartilage taken off in the ACL. Though, right, right, right. And he was saying it's just the friction of the you know when you're running all the time on concrete so yeah i don't think i'll be, I'll be doing but, but, but we'll see and and in fairness to you mike you do other endurance challenges and and this is with anyone uh, if they have injuries or not of injuries a marathon can be s- so different from person yeah. to person something yeah. to keep someone active i think is, is is just the important part have you any kind of guiding principles that you live by guiding principles yeah. that i live by yeah like oh man that's a good one now um just straight straight away when you've said that. The, Sorry, we didn't. I didn't prep any questions for you, so <laughs> <laughs> it's the best way to do it. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah. So straight away when you said that, um, I I've spoken on my dad a couple of times before, but very lucky to have have him in my life and in our life, our family life. He's just an incredible man. But um, each Sunday we we chat on a Sunday. Um, I'd call home and we chat for about fifteen twenty minutes, and every Sunday he'll give me a line. Um, a quote or like a life lesson or something like that. Yeah. So I could reel off a bunch of ones from him, but I'll stick with one for now. Uh, he's one that, that he consistently says, and it's to live in the present. He says, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow may, may never come to live oh. in the present. And that's something that, and I still do it like, but we spend so much time worrying about what's gone. Historically, are we, worry so much about something that may never happen yeah. that we forget to live in the present um, and I think it's a, it's a very good yeah. one one of my favourite ones for you Seamus win the morning win the day <laughs> that's right how did I not think of that one straight away <laughs> but that was a good one if I, if, if, if I prompted you you might have thought of that but I love that one and just tease that one out for us it's about all getting a good start to the morning or getting your gym session in and you're set up for the day isn't it big time yeah yeah big time and I was going going through talk about going through college. Uh, definitely was not a morning person. Um, and then what one was that was? I think I definitely stole it from somewhere, Mike. I, I I'd love to lay claim to it. But I definitely <laughs> stole it from somewhere. And yeah, just starting the morning off well, having a bit of a routine. Um, one thing a good friend of my said to me recently, Paul Gordon, is getting up at the same time every day, um, makes a big difference. And then build a morning routine off of that. Mm. Um, whether it's like five minutes of exercise, whether it's 15, whether it's a bit of reading, everybody is different, but just having, having a set. And you're a morning person now, well, if you're in the fitness industry, you're kind of nearly forced to be a morning person, aren't you, for the classes? Yes, or, yeah, big time. Do you, find it, do you find it hard or easy to get up in the morning? I find it easy. This, and it goes back to uh, doing something that you love. Um, the drive is there when you wake up in the morning. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm... I, I'm incredibly lucky I, I'm doing something that I love and yeah. then the people that I'm working with and uh, just the, getting to go in and when I see someone whether it's a personal training session or a group session I really love in the morning time you've got people strolling in and they've got a Dunkin Donuts and their head is hanging and they're not in the mood for exercise at all. Jeez, you have a great gang there with the Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> with a coffee like or a donut. <laughs> <laughs> a coffee. A coffee. Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the, 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 the difference between them from when they stroll in a minute before class to 40 or 45 minutes later is, is incredible. And that, that's, mm. 
that's one that really resonates with them. Win the morning, win the day. Yeah. Because I've yet to, like people, <laughs> it's funny, like with the way media goes and everything. And, and the excuses that people give is like, oh, is exercise good for you? Or exercise is, is bad for you. Yeah. And da, da, da. people will tell each other what they, or tell their, themselves what they want to. But um, I've yet, and I've trained hundreds of people, I've yet to find someone who was in a worse mood at the end of an exercise session compared to at the start. Yeah, yeah. And tell me, so what time do you get up generally weekdays? What time are you getting up at? Generally six or half six weekdays. For like seven o'clock class, is it? Or? Uh, for se- seven or eight a.m. sessions, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what time are you going to sleep at? Um, going to sleep then half ten, eleven. All right. Do you get your eight hours? I do try. <laughs> Som- <laughs> sometimes it's not as not as good. <laughs> do you have a routine the night before, like, and do you find it easy to sleep? Or Reece, the last couple of weeks now have been good for getting to bed at half ten. Okay. Um, there was a couple of weeks before that where it wasn't as good. Yeah, and and to be fair, we we're traveling and stuff like yeah. that, so we were kind of all over the place. But no, the last two weeks have been good and uh, getting a decent night's sleep. Do you have something to eat before you go out to the training session in the morning? No, don't. I uh, don't eat really much in the morning. And, and again, this is different for everyone. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But and what, I don't. And what you, you come back then for your breakfast? What's for breakfast? A breaky in the morning is scrambled eggs and a bit of a, a bit of avocado. Can't beat it. <laughs> and beans is it you said kidney beans oh yeah put the kidney beans in as well yeah. no bread uh, not in the morning bread is bad uh, no it's not bad it's <laughs> if not you tell an hour throwing the bread at me like <laughs> it's like New Year's Eve when she's bent <laughs> bread <laughs> and ice cream isn't bad either I like it ice cream you have a sweet tooth Seamus don't you tell ha- us you have a sweet tooth I have a hound of a sweet tooth Mike <laughs> that's my vice my vice is chocolate and ice cream I have to watch that <laughs> Right now, Seamus, I have a quick fire round for you. Good man. <laughs> this is definitely unprepared now. <laughs> Favourite food? Uh, chocolate. What kind of chocolate? Um, Cadbury's. Cadbury, dairy milk? Yeah. Oh, 100%. yeah. With a cup of tea. Yeah. Cup of tea. No, oh, you're oh, talking. What do you call it in mail? Call it a cup of tea. <laughs> Strong tea. Strong <laughs> tea. Favourite drink? Favourite drink? Um, milk. Cold pint of milk with the chocolate. Ooh. Favorite color? Um, red. Ah, danger. Yeah. Favorite thing to do to unwind? Oh, to unwind, man. It's, it's, it's classic fitness trainer. Do exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Climb Kirkpatrick. Climb Kirkpatrick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of your idols. Who do you look up to? Um, some of my idols. Definitely, my my dad is a great man. Um, that's a stereotypical one, but he is, he's an incredible person. Um, who are my idols besides that in a pro- professional sense? Um, they're not professional. Hugh Jackman is dude. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hugh Jackman is, is definitely a dude. Biggest influence in your life? Um, a hundred percent my dad. Go back in time or go into the future? Oh, uh, future. <laughs> We'll see what it's like. Right. Then we'll come back in time when we Trump or Biden. End <laughs> <laughs> Kenny. End <laughs> Kenny. I'm a blue shirt. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> oh mayo. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've decided favourite mayo player. Andy Moore in past. Who's uh, present? Kira McDonald, man. Kira, oh, Jesus. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kira McDonald. Uh, uh, yeah, you had to say Andy Moore. <laughs> <laughs> and who present I'll have to go for someone present after the last day Jeremy O'Connor how's ah, about that yeah, keeping yeah. from the sideline yeah oh that was class that was class Unreal. tell me something about you we don't really know or we wouldn't really know something that well, I kind of I, I kind of said it there earlier with the piano and all that so we need yeah, to, yeah. Um, petrified, heights. Uh, petrified of heights what petrified of heights oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're only a couple of stories off here Oh yeah, yeah, afraid of heights. So yeah. you, that's why you go climbing mountains, so Seamus, is it because you're afraid of heights? Exactly, exactly. Theory, and yeah. I've I've jumped out of a plane a couple of times. The, the first. Oh, you did that, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Uh, in New York, I did it in New York. Recommended. Hundred yeah. percent. Again, like going ah, going class. out of the comfort zone. It's incredible because uh, I I like genuinely when I was back in school, I had a job a couple of summers with an electrician. When I was going from the bottom floor to the first floor so on a ladder 
I'd mm. get scared at the top of the ladder. I'd start shaking. Jeez. Uh, that's that's. Uh, I've got a lot better now, like since doing stuff like that. But yeah, I was glad. Jeez. Uh, where did you do that? I did that in um, New Pals. Skydive the Ranch, I think it's called. Ah, where's where's New Pals? New Pals, about two hours away, pop past Newburgh, um, across the river from Cold Spring. All right. It's pretty, fairly close. Will Mayo win, Sam? This of course. Year? Of course we will. And I can say that with 100% conviction. What will Mayo be like if you win, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> You won't be able to listen to us. <laughs> you won't be able to handle us. Nearly, nearly as bad as Cork if they win. Jesus. The uh, how do you cope with losing? <laughs> <laughs> sure, we're used to it. Oh God. <laughs> we the best thing about it is like I, I'm love being from Mayo. I really love being from Mayo. Do you say Mayo or Mayo? Or does it depend who you're talking to? The first one. Mayo, the first mayo. one <laughs> I think The sauce You say mayo Mayo yeah Amy yeah. Brett says mayo I think Maybe she ah, she's, from a, she's from a, a funny part of the county <laughs> I thought that alright <laughs> <laughs> But yeah I love being from mayo Like those Those all Ireland final Sundays Even Even though we don't win them <laughs> There's some Great hope And anticipation <laughs> Up to like the 65th minute you can't beat the, the time, the few hours before the final and then the final itself there. It's great crack. Um, favorite thing about New York? Um, the, the hustle of it. Mm. Yeah. Getting things done. Favorite thing about me? About you, Mike. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> Definitely. I complimented you before the interview. It's unbelievable. Great. He, spent, he spent about a half an hour getting ready. To no, no, no. I cut, I cut that. I cut that. I cut that. <laughs> Your greatest achievement? <laughs> greatest achievement? Oh man! Uh, all of the, the the charity stuff that we've been involved with. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that off the top of my head, um, and that's all been a communal effort. It hasn't been 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 me, but in the last couple of years, especially with the groups that we have, I'd say we've raised two or three hundred thousand for charities. Mm. So that's very proud of that. The slide, the one, of course, you did a marathon for the slide the last year. Um, tell me about that that's the end of the quick fire round <laughs> <laughs> thank god I was getting worried about what was coming there that was, that was PG enough I think I got away slightly I got away lightly it's, using a, that, it's you, a family audience I'm using that as a template this one <laughs> um, about the slaunter that's right yeah. that started that started I was chatting to uh, someone this morning about that actually um, it started as as a whim at the end of April, around 2020 time as yeah. well, when everything was just all over the place. And again, Catherine Flood's brainwave, who I mentioned earlier on in the podcast. Yeah. And we decided to do a 5K, basically a 5K themed fitness event um, over the course of May 2020 for a slaughter for uh, Irish people who were who were disadvantaged or who were hit hard by the pandemic. Yeah, it's raising money for people who are out of work for because of the the lockdowns, wasn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, there was a couple of organisations, the Ashley Centre, New York GA, a couple of other immigration groups yes. got together and did a big fundraiser. Yeah, there was exactly yeah, and at the start of it, when I was chatting to Catherine, um, we were thinking this could be big. Like if we get our our, our running groups and the mm. Ashley Centre group and a few others involved. This could be massive. And I remember we set it. I thought it was a tentative goal and she thought it was a tentative goal of $10,000 um, on like the GoFundMe or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, we fished the idea with a few people and they were there like, you'll never get 10,000. There's so many things going on, you know? Um, and just to talk about the power of community and the power of getting, the more people you get involved, yeah. the, 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 more, the more impact that you'll have. To make a long story short, between May 1st and 31st, we raised, I think it was 83,000. Um, so, yeah, it was... Yeah, but how, how did you raise it? And you you ended up doing a marathon yourself, I think, was it at the end? On the final day, we said that uh, Catherine, myself, and Shane Finn was heavily involved with that as oh. well, in, uh, even though he was in Ireland. And we said on the final day, if we, if we got past, like, 50,000, we'd run a marathon. I had no, I'd no training at all done for this. Shane would do it in his sleep um, and Catherine had, had, hadn't much either but we said if we hit 50 thinking we were safe enough you know 
we're not going to get 50 we, yeah. we get 10 <laughs> and we'd 50 got by like the 20th of may <laughs> and the marathon was 11 days later so i was thinking right better to start doing a bit of training for this <laughs> I remember seeing you that day. It was it was a hot day, and we were all down in Massbit, was it That's outside right, of Gibbons' yeah. home? And uh, it's a famous day, yeah, it's a great day. Yeah, great it was just the kind of it was the first kind of things were just beginning to kind of kind of uh, reopen slightly. Well, they kind of opened that day for us. They did. It, we did, <laughs> did diddly eye on the back of the, the, the on the on the on a truck as well. It was, was deadly. It, it was, was like great. an old Irish festival. It was a great day. It was, it was a great yeah. community. You could. It was like being at home. Like everyone was out, like kind of comfy final thing. Or exactly. Mayo losing Sam again or something. Like that. It was great. <laughs> <Fuck you>. <laughs> <laughs> Peep. <laughs> no cursing. <laughs> Um, I'm another one here. Uh, do you see yourself settling in the US or do you see yourself going home or have you took any thought in the matter? Um, uh, very little thought to be honest with you, Mike. If there's that in the past year or two has taught me is not to plan too far ahead. Yeah. I love the mix between the two. I said earlier on when you said what's the best thing about New York is the hustle. Mm. The best thing about home is the quietness. Um, usually year to year before the pandemic I'd be home four or five times. Right. So I, I love spending time between the two places. They're two very different places and uh, I love them for two, for two di very different reasons. Um, but yeah, in the next couple of years, more of the same. Uh, spending as much time as I can at home while doing a bit here. And then after that, who knows, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten home? You were home for Christmas for you? I was home last Christmas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was home last Christmas. I've, I've a good one for that, actually. So I uh, at last Christmas you had to do quarantine. It was down to like maybe 10 days. I think it's gone now since if we go home. But um, I was thinking, where would I do my quarantine? You know, with Dublin or Lewisburg. And I thought if I do it in Dublin, then I, my sister lives up there and a couple of others, they'll definitely be calling over. So it won't be real quarantine. I thought if I do it in Lewisburg, then my dad would definitely, we have two houses, but he would 100% be up and down to me and my uncles would or whatever. Yeah. So uh, I rent, I got a camper van off a friend in Roscommon and um, I used it. Uh, I got a load of supplies at the start of the 10 days. And uh, when you say supplies, no shame. It's just, uh, it's just, <laughs> I just clarify a small bit. We won't go into, won't go into details <laughs> there, Michael. Now. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave it grey. Go on. <laughs> go on. Anyway. And spend, spent the quarantine like, going around beaches and, oh, and yeah. mountains around the country. Not everyone's ideal life of quarantine, but it's flipping great. Jeez. It was lovely. There's no Wi-Fi here. It was, it was very peaceful. Like, uh, how, Where did you go? Went to uh, Sligo, Donegal, Clare, Kerry, all along the West Coast. Jeez. Galway, yeah. yeah. Any plans of going home this year or what's the, the story? Would love to. Yeah, would love to. Um, we'll see now if Mr. Biden... I'll, I'll, uh, he, he might go ahead and Kenny if you'd open up this, this uh, travel, yeah. travel van. Where is Ender these days? I don't know. He's actually he's a good, good fa family friend. Oh, uh, you? oh yeah, yeah. He's he's an island eighty man, and his 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 father, um, and my grandfather were were good friends. All oh, right, okay. With the pub that we had he used to call call out there quite oh, a bit. Right. So um, yeah, I don't know. He'd be my dad would would know all right, but. So you're being, I, I wouldn't you, be texting him. <laughs> I met him out here when he was out here. To, he was at uh, the Mayo game, of course, two years ago. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. you could talk. Like, he was, yeah. Uh, I don't know the hand. video mishap that day as well, but in fairness, he, <laughs> <laughs> he redid the interview for me. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. With anything with you, Mike, it's two takes. <laughs> two takes, Dorgan. <laughs> Is there anything else now we need to cover, Seamus? <laughs> We've got through a lot there now. We Mike, have, in fairness. Yeah, we got through. Will Cork win the hurling at the weekend? Uh, will Nemo win the county Sunday week? Now that's the main <laughs> thing. The mind Cork and the hurling, it's all about Nemo. They'll, they'll fly you back with it. <laughs> Not the way I'm playing. <laughs> no, they're playing next year. They're playing last year's county final sun, Sunday oh, really? the week. So by the time we get this out, they'll probably have it over and done with it. Right. <laughs> right very right, slow right. to turn them around. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I have another one here. Just written down. Has said uh, has so the fitness industry has changed. Has it changed for the good or the better or the worse? Oh, good question, man. Very good question, actually. Um, yeah, a lot more stuff has got gone online for sure. Um, you can't beat the personal touch. Mm. I'm a firm believer in that. 
um, with any kind of coaching, whether it's health and fitness or whether it's school or business, the personal touch is, is, is massive. One, one big positive is that it's made everyone accessible. So if there was, if there was someone I wanted to learn from in London, I can access a course of theirs or videos yeah. of theirs. Um, so it's good that way. But then the flip side of it is that um, too much on st- online stuff. I certainly find with the computer stuff and, and the Instagram, as I said, I do a bit of it and I've got yeah. to enjoy it a bit more. I generally do about an hour a day. But having my head stuck in a phone or on a computer or looking at videos too much day to day, I'd fry it a bit. I'd love to see you do more Instagram because you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're a great guy. Would you not? You're not, well, Laura's out of 24 7, as you know, like, but I'd like to say, I want to see what Seamus is doing there. But uh, you're a very private guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let out what's safe, Mike. What's the. Um, so if it's raining, though, when you're doing your classes, where do you go? Have you somewhere to shelter? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. And that was that, that's a common question, actually, we get with people is if it's raining, will yeah. we have class? And if you look at all of the other classes at the at the turf um, talk about Instagram, they'll put their posts out in the morning or oh, it's raining this evening. So there's no class. Yeah. Um, whereas we always have class. Mm. We actually started um, back in February when me and John Collins were 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 doing the classes originally. It was in the middle of the second snowstorm um, and there was about eight or ten inches of snow. Mm. And the very first class we did, we had to furrow away like a 12 foot by 12 foot <laughs> space um, to train yeah. the eight or ten people that arrived. And they turned up today? They turned up? They turned up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's about, oh, they'd, they, they'd, they'd registered beforehand. They'll turn up to the first week anyway. After that, <laughs> then you could be dodgy. <laughs> And um, enthusiasm was high. So for for the Hanuman, that's a different. It's a different type of training, isn't it? Tell me more about the Hanuman Owens place. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very unique type of training. Um, Owen Owens' philosophy, to keep it in layman's terms, is 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 move better um, and move more. So move pain free in in a sense. And Owen does some amazing work with both general population. Um, from people at 80, 90 year old women that haven't exercised in years or been afraid Gee. to exercise yeah. to like to high level athletes. He, he takes um, people who've had like chronic pains for a long, long time and uh, fixes them basically, which is an immensely powerful thing. And it's all about like coordination. What's the technical kind of, I see the, the planks of wood and stuff. And yeah. Exactly. He he br- breaks it down into a range of different like physical attributes. The planks of wood specifically would be for balance or testing balance. So a big reason why people would have falls, for example, um, was mm. would be because simply they don't have good enough balance. So by training something like that, um, they won't fall. And that's that's relevant for for an athlete, or it's relevant for like an elderly person who'd be going down steps or something like that as well. What are some I have two questions. What are some of the common misconceptions or mistakes that people make in fitness? And there's another one. What I just, even around here, I can't fathom when people go, <laughs> people will probably listen to this now, but they, fast food, like, mm. people go fast food, like, I don't know how many times a week, like, what's the Denny's or something up here? I'm, I'm just, KFC, Burger King, I just don't, I can't understand how people, but so many people do do it. And like, that's why there's some, like we're in an age now where there's so much information, but a lot of people are still very unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. There's never, and, and that was when I was starting off talking about fear. And um, one of the big things I used to tell myself for not quitting my job and start and being a fitness trainer was that there's so many fitness trainers, like uh, yeah. the world doesn't need another one. Yeah. Um, but one guy, Martin Rooney, I went to a seminar of his at the very start, um, of me being a trainer and he had a great line. He said, um, there's never, ever been as much knowledge in health and fitness. There's never been as many professionals, fitness professionals. There's never been as many qualifications, but he said, there's never, ever been as many unhealthy, overweight, obese people ever in the world. So he broke it down. He said, there's lots of good trainers who train themselves and keep themselves fit, but there's very few good coaches who impulse others to do it. 
And it was a really good, it was like a euphoria mo moment for me. And it mm. made me realize that, okay, I can make this work by coming, yeah. by becoming yeah. a good coach. And there, so what are there some mistakes that people make all the time or they do? So I know a lot of people focus on fat instead of maybe calories and. Um, yeah, keeping it basic and ke keeping with the, the people that we work with. Um, a lot of people either over complicate it um, or they look at too big a picture. So what I mean by that is um, they, th they do too much too soon. So taking a New Year's resolution as an example, uh, a person will go gung-ho and go to the gym seven times the first week of January. They'll go five times the following week, three times the following week, and then they'll get fed up and then the gym membership won't be used for the rest of the year. Yeah. So consistency over intensity. That's something we, we really pre preach. It's better to go two to three times a week than six times one week and not yeah. for another three months. And is what's the key to it? Is it about setting goals or is it about having a routine and sticking to it that so many people kind of fall off the they set their New Year's resolution or is it just that it's just a fast it's a fast society we live in these days? Or yeah. Just people y you touched on it there. Um habit. Having having exercise or whatever it is as a daily habit. Yeah. And again, going going back to people who who overcomplicate it and, and, and think too big, if you like. Like, I, we work with a lot of, of busy mothers who have, like, three, four children, and they do not have a lot of time. Like, yeah. So, but we, there's always 20 or 30 minutes in a day or every second day that we find that they can exercise. And they look at that as a non-negotiable. When they start working with us, it's like, right, that's an appointment. I have to be, I have yeah. to do my exercise that day. Yeah. And then it becomes a habit. <clears throat> And when you're out there, then it's just so or like if you've got someone who's super fit and someone who's old, it's just a matter of they do an extra couple of sets and lighter weight and everyone is putting each other together. Completely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one thing we do uh, with, the, with the outdoor classes, for example, is um, we have like various weights. So people would do more reps or they'd lift heavier or something like that. Mm. Um. But then one thing we always preach to people is when they're coming in, especially is they probably haven't done this type of exercise for a long time or mm. maybe any exercise. Mm. So it's just take it at your own level because going back to habit, we, we tend to overestimate what we get, what we can do in like a day or a week, yeah. but we underestimate what we can get done in like a month or three months when we look yeah. back at it. Our fitness trainers very kind of philosophical and they spend, which is great. They spend a lot of time in mental health to, not well, mental health but yeah, it is mental health like but about how trying to kind of pry out the positives and that's why you know you've got a great positive attitude but do you, fitness trainers look into that a lot <clears throat> compared to other genres like it is related like the fitness side and the, the mental side yeah definitely it's it it has a hundred percent got gotten that way because most of fitness is is behavioral change hmm. and going back to when Generally, when I meet someone or meet a client for the first time who wants to work with us, um, the problem is not lack of knowledge. Most people know what to do. They know they have to exercise more and eat better, but they don't do what they know. Mm. So it all comes down to the mind. Mm. Deadly. Deadly. <laughs> I have that written at the top there. That's one of your good phrases, Seamus. Deadly. <laughs> you can have it. Give it to you positive the positive attitude do you find it where do you get it from and where's your source of inspiration for the positive attitude and do you find it hard to keep talking to people every day and keeping that positive mindset going or, um, is, or is it just yeah as i said earlier on thanks for for saying that it's that i take that as a massive compliment um but with, without thinking too much on it i mentioned my dad a couple of times he's a very positive guy when people say say something similar to him, um, he turns to them and he says, "Well, if you give me money, I'll I'll be negative. If you pay me, I'll give you me I'll be negative." So uh, yeah, look at I'm not positive all of the time by any means, but I try my best to. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think we have a have a choice at the start of the day to fall on the right side or the wrong side of the bed, and I try my best to fall on the right <laughs> side as much as I can. <laughs> Thanks Thank a million, my man. Appreciate you, it. <laughs> that was deadly. Why, Santi? Why, Birani? 
And that's all for this week. Let us know what you think by leaving us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Long Haul Podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and on your streaming provider to ensure that you get instantly notified for all new releases. If you'd like to sign up to Seamus' six-week training session to get you in shape for the run, you can reach out to Seamus via his Instagram account at Clan Health. That's at C-L-A-N-N-H-E-A-L-T-H. There's a link to sign up in his bio. And don't forget to check out our updated website, thelonghaulpodcast.com, for the latest Irish-American sports news stories, including New York GA match reports. We will have news and interviews from Sunday's New York Senior Football Final Clash between Barnabas and Sligo up on the site next week. And of course, all of our podcasts are up there too. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review with your podcast provider. This will ensure that we can get more podcasts to you more often. And thanks for listening. Oh, you New York girls, can you dance the polka? And when we got inside the house, the drinks were passed around. The liquor was so awful strong.